Australian. This is AWC in Conversation. I'm Joey Clark, an ecologist and science communicator based in Sydney. And I live and work on Gadigal country and pay my respects to the traditional owners and indigenous ranger groups who we work with around Australia. Since we last spoke, there have been some highlights uh, of the week, and I hope a lot of you caught the story of the bilbies breeding at Mallee Cliffs National Park. We'll have more about that project next week, but if you didn't, I really encourage you to go to our website and watch the video of those bilbies. Uh, it's great work that's been done by the team uh, down based in Mildura, um, and watching this video of young bilbies being born in New South Wales for the first time in 100 years will make your day I guarantee. Uh, so it got quite widespread coverage on ABC News, Channel 9 um, and various other places. So do catch up on that. Uh, and again, that story is on our website. Okay, I'd like to introduce my guest today, AWC Chief Executive Tim Allard. Tim joined AWC in 2011 as National Operations Manager. And in that role, he led a major expansion of our fenced cat, uh, cat and fox free areas and helped establish several of our landmark partnerships which have really set a course for AWC to continue shaping the future of conservation in this country. In 2018, Tim was appointed Chief Executive and Tim joins us now from Perth. Welcome, Tim. Good morning, Joseph. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Uh, a little bit cold, but I hear it's rainy in Perth, so can't complain. <laughs> That's right. We've got some major storms, so if it gets a bit noisy here, I apologise in advance. Um, All right. Just one quick point before we move on. So similar to you, I acknowledge the spirit of the Noongar Budja, the country in which I live, and pay respects to its Noongar custodians, along with all First Nations people in their country, the land in which I work. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear about your background because you actually grew up in the bush, but you've, you've moved across the country. So uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what that was like. Sure. So... Yeah, I originate in Victoria, so those who watched the bushfire catastrophe, catastrophe across the summer, um, there was a place called Malakuta um, where many people were evacuated. It was quite a traumatic experience and a number of houses were lost. So I spent part of my childhood growing up in Malakuta and Can River, and we had a cattle property just north of Can River at a little place called Nuremberg. Um so you know, I lived there until I was about 14 years old. And you know, with the photo you're showing, that's the 1983 Ash Wednesday fires that burnt much of Victoria, all the way down through to Melbourne. And I think even on the, the west coast of Victoria as well. And it, you know, when you look at these photos, it's a bit of a reminder that fire is a part of the Australian landscape. And I vividly remember my dad was a national parks ranger for some of my childhood. And some of those national parks in Eastern Victoria that people might be aware of, Crowa Jingalong National Park, Cooper Canberra, the Arunundra, um, Wing and Inlet, all these areas in East Gippsland, Dad had a lot, large part to play with in, in getting them set up. And so a lot of my childhood was, was getting out in the bush and enjoying the bush and watching when bushfires impacted. You know, and it's something we'll touch on through the talk, Joey, but you know, we, it's one of the realisations, one of the understandings we as Australians need to come to grips with that fire is a part of the Australian landscape. So the future is not about eliminating fire, it's about how we best utilise fire as a tool for managing the landscape. You mentioned that um, you, you grew up in, in that area of East Gippsland and your dad was a National Parks Ranger. Do you remember going out with him and what that was like, you know, working in the bush and seeing the work that he was involved in? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I have these vivid memories. Um, there was a National Parks office in Can River. Um, I remember sitting in there and listening to a discussion about the one of the Potteroo species that had been identified at one of the small national parks not far from Can River. And at the time I would have been 10 or 11 years old or something and not really understanding what it meant, but understanding with excitement, which it was talked about, that this was something pretty special. And then able to go down to places on the coast of the Wing and Inlet um, through to Point Hicks and Cape Everard, through that Erinundra Plateau area. Just all these fantastic parts of the Australian landscape and that particular East Gippsland area is a pretty magical place. Uh, I was quite privileged to grow up in such a, a special place. Yeah, and it's an area that's that's home to a number of threatened species. As you said, we've heard a lot about them recently with the bushfires, especially those potaroos. It's also home to koalas. Um, and 
you know, we might come back to this, but you know, it's it's an area where we're interested in establishing a project to try and help with some of those species that are under intense pressure now. Um, but Tim, despite that early brush with conservation work, it wasn't a direct path into this field for you, was it? No, like all good conservationists, I then joined the Navy <laughs> and spent 10 years in the Navy. And I was, I was very fortunate. I joined when I was about 17 and a half. There's a very rugged and windswept looking individual um, with my ghastly attempt at a beard, at probably at the grand age of about 23 or 24. Um, but I was, I was very lucky. I joined the Navy, um, was able to travel the world and, and experience a lot of cultures, visiting places like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, the US, Southeast Asia, Italy. Um, so I did very well. I was very lucky, um, you know, traveling the world despite a propensity for seasickness. Um, then I left the Navy and moved into uh, engineering um, and worked through the oil and gas mining uh, and large infrastructure projects. You know, we delivered projects or I managed projects in Karratha in the northwest of Western Australia at the, the Woodside LNG projects um, through the Alcoa uh, bauxite refineries sites through to in Sydney on a wastewater treatment plant. And people might remember in the bad old days when there was raw effluent outflow into Bondi Beach. So I was part of the team that helped install a new water treatment plant um, through to some of the early water treatment processes, desalination plants here in Western Australia. So I was very fortunate again, you know, I've been very fortunate through my career of working in a whole range of areas, um, traveling the world and then working through a whole range of industries and a wide range of projects. Um, and I think, um, yeah, through that period, I moved from project management to operations management. And finally, I was general manager of an engineering company here in Perth uh, before I joined AWC in 2011. I've got another photo from your time in the Navy here, Tim, or I assume that's what it's from. Um, do you want to just describe to us where this is and what's going on? So that's on what's called a landing craft, which is self-explanatory. Um, these are the vessels where you can drive tanks and jeeps onto and you take them somewhere and drop them off. Um, and we did a trip across Northern Australia. I'd left Cairns, went to Darwin, and then this is on the Victoria River. And it's, it's one of those 360 moments that you have in life that this is actually not far from the Bullo River Station, the property we're now managing or working on in partnership with the, the landholders. So it's probably just a little bit downstream of Bullo River, uh, of the Bullo River confluence with the Victoria River. Um, and so we've parked up to drop off some soldiers to go off and do their soldiering thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's one of those 360 points in, you, you have in life from time to time of not quite realising where I was going to end up um, 10 years later. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to Potteroos and we might come back to Bullo River as well to talk about um, how they sure. popped up later in your, in your career. Uh, do you remember what was that, that turning point that made you think you wanted to do something different? So you, you described you've been working on these big infrastructure projects, engineering projects. Um, what was the appeal of coming to work for a conservation group like AWC? It, it's a really good question and it's a question I get a lot um, from people you know, about how I've ended up at AWC, given that background. Yeah, certainly a part of it is you know, my childhood. You know, growing up in the bush on a farm in a place like Can River at Mallacoota, um, you know, that National Park's influence of my dad early on. Um, I think that always resonates and that always stays with you. It, you can talk to a lot of people about what, what's influenced their career choices or their life choices and that has a lot to do with their childhood. And I think after you know, working in those industries of oil and gas and mining and so on for a good 15 odd years. You know, I developed pretty good skills, I think, um, in operational and business management. Um, and whilst it wasn't a philosophical awakening of mining and oil and gas is bad, it was just realizing that I had skills that could be put to better use, um, that I could contribute something uh, and give back to help make the country a better place. And so I started looking and I vividly remember opening the Weekend Australian on this particular weekend, September 2011, um, opening it up and there was this big ad for Australian Wildlife Conservancy National Operations Manager. And about four days later, I was in an interview with Martin Copley, the founder of AWC, Graham Morgan, the now chair of AWC, and Atticus Fleming, my predecessor. Um, and four weeks later, I was working at AWC. 
It's a, a, a big shift, but we're certainly glad you made it. And, you know, lots of hands-on experience with these sorts of infrastructure projects. Yeah. It was a fortuitous time to join because we were at that point embarking on a big expansion of our feral predator-free fenced areas. And actually one of the first projects that you were closely involved with was building the fence at Mount Gibson. Do you want to talk a little bit about that project? Sure. So, yeah, I joined... AWC, it was either late November or early December in 2011. Um, and we had a board meeting and Martin turned towards me at the end of the board, meetings, board, board meeting and said, go build a fence at Mount Gibson. So, okay. My last project four weeks ago was working in an oil and gas project in Karatha. Um, so I had to educate myself on fence areas. But it turned out to be a great way to immerse myself in conservation um, to get to know the conservation practitioners from the land managers and the ecologists. And I was able to apply a whole range of the skills that I'd developed through my career. You know, ultimately it's a, it's a big infrastructure project. You know, we had to w go through a process of identifying the, the animals that we wanted to return, the habitat that they needed to, to survive and understanding the carrying capacity. We then started to map out fence alignments and getting that checked and having teams of ecologists with backpacks trudging through the bush, looking at fence alignments. Um, through to the fence design and Joey if we had about three hours I could bore you to death for about three hours on the intricacies of fence design. Unfortunately we're limited to about <laughs> half an hour in <laughs> but uh, yeah so it's you know it's very very much a practical role um, and right. a, a major project like that but you know the success of that approach so you know fenced areas are one of the one of our signature um, programs and Mount Gibson now, it's home to more reintroduced mammals than anywhere else in the country. We've had eight species re-established within that fenced area. So, you know, you had really frontline experience working on, on those projects in a really hands-on way. Um, so it was about seven years in that role as National Operations Manager. And, you know, you were getting familiar with all of our different sanctuaries and getting to know the staff. Do you want to talk about some of the people you met as you travelled around to the various AWC sanctuaries? Yeah, you know, again, the an organisation is nothing without its people. And that applies to the people we have in the field, it applies to the board, it applies to people who support AWC. The people are what makes the organisation. And as the operations manager, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate that I had a team that... Um, you know, we all respected each other and liked each other. I had a wide range of um, people within that cohort, you know, but it's an example of what makes AWC such a successful organisation. And if, if I just step back one point, one of the things that attracted me to AWC is very much the business-like approach that it's, you can't manage what you don't measure. And AWC is all about measuring, collecting information, collecting data, and using that to, uh, to inform your programs. Um, and coming from that previous 15 years of really business and project management, that's exactly what it's all about. And so it resonated with me to do that. And then meeting the people that, yeah, particularly in the operations team, if I look across the sanctuary manager cohort, we've got uh, ex-electricians, people, you know, we've got three qualified electricians uh, in the team. We've got stonemasons, bush nurses, uh, watchmakers and boat builders. We've got fencing contractors and fence builders. And these are all these people that are bringing that life experience to AWC to help solve those pressing conservation issues. And they've chosen to make that their vocation and their career. And it is, it's bloody inspirational to go and spend time with people like that, to understand that they're living their dream. They're doing what they want to do with their life. And then you, you start to work then across with the ecologists and AWC is all about integrating the science with the land management. And then I got to meet people like you, Joey, and I think we spent some time in the Artesian Range together in 2013, it might have been. Um, and you're know, learning all about the grass wren um, that you're doing your honours project on and being able to spend time with people that have chosen to go to university and make conservation their life's work, their passion, yeah, that's what gets me out of bed every day. It's it's such a it's such a, um, a a direct connection to the values of what makes a person tick. We often talk about AWC as a family, um, and I think that's partly what you're describing. You know, everyone's driven by a shared passion for what they're doing, 
Um, as you've talked about, 80% of our staff are based in the field. So they're people that have dedicated their lives to doing this work and they, they all agree that it's really important work. Um, for people who have just joined in the last few minutes, I just wanna let you know that you can ask questions as we go. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button and that's where you can ask questions of Tim or I that we'll uh, come to at the end. Uh, the chat button is there for tech support. So if you have any problems connecting, you can use that one. Um, so Tim, you were uh, operations manager across the whole country for, for that seven year period. And then you were appointed as, as chief executive. Do you want to talk about some of the projects that have uh, that you've worked on in the time since you've been chief executive? It's certainly, you know, we've certainly not slowed down. If anything, we've increased the, the rate of work. Yeah, I think that's one of the things about AWC is that it's never a dull day. Um, we've always got a lot to do, but I think that actually speaks to the, you know, there's a time critical issue in Australia with conservation. We've got species continually being pushed to the brink. And so when I became chief executive, uh, we put in place the Bullo River Partnership. So just at the, the top end of the, or the halfway between the Northern Territory and Western Australia. There you go. Thank you, Joey. Um, and that's a, an innovative partnership between a pastoral operation and conservation. We put in place the Willingen Partnership. Um, if you can hover over that again, Joey. Um, and that was a flow on from the success of the Dumberman Yardi partnership in the Northwest Kimberley. Um, so these are you know, a couple of really key innovative projects that are gonna set us up or provide models that enables us to do more work in the future. Of more recent times, the Kangaroo Island project, uh, which we've you know, really in a, in a matter of months, we've, uh, we've stepped in, provided resources, to secure the future of the Kangaroo Island Dunna, one of Australia's most at-risk species. You know, we've completed fenced areas in the Pilligra and Mallee Cliffs and everybody, as you, as you said, Joey, um, we've had bilbies breeding. So we're certainly not stopped. And as you said, we've probably accelerated a little bit. Um, but yeah, and just, uh, you know, sorry, just, just looking at that map, you know, we're, we're now working at 30 sites. And I remember, I think when I started, it was around 20. So, you know, it's a, a massive expansion in the area that we're managing. So we're working at scale across the country. Now working either alone or in partnership across 6.5 million hectares. So that's roughly the size of Tasmania, if you add up all of our different projects. Um, do you want to just describe what, as CEO, what your priorities are for the organisation? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I think on the transition from the operations role, operations is much more of an inward focusing role where it's, it's about the work that we're doing and making sure we have the right people and the right systems and equipment to do work. But the chief executive role is much more outwardly focused about where are we going, who are we partnering and collaborating with. The, you know, many people that have followed AWC over the years would realise that much of our early future was through acquisition. You know, we secured land through acquisition. Um, and probably in the last five years, um, it's been, we've had a trend towards partnerships. And it's a deliberate trend that if we, we talk about, we talk a lot at AWC about effective conservation, but really what does effective conservation mean? Well, it really means getting outcomes, having tangible outcomes that you can measure. You know, we know that we protect 88% of all bird species, 72% of all mammals, 54% of all reptiles. So that means we have a mission gap. That means we then start to prioritize of where we want to go and what work we want to do into the future. So we're looking at the partnerships. Or, so what we're looking at is how do we secure access to land to deliver more effective conservation? And we can use all those models that we've developed over the last three, four, five years, such as the partnership in New South Wales with national parks, the Bullo River pastoralism, Willingen, Dumbum and Yardi partnerships. We know that 75 million hectares of land in Australia is under some form of Indigenous protected area. 51% of the Australian land mass is under, managed under some form of pastoralism or agriculture. It's self-evident that many of the future conservation outcomes are going to be in that, that area. So we will do more partnerships, but we will also look for more um, uh, you know, acquisition opportunities in the right circumstances. The, in terms of other activities, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time building our relationship with government at state and federal level. Um, and I'm on the phone, it feels like every week at the moment um, with federal government representatives on a range of issues, uh, particularly as we're moving through a review of the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act. 
um, to make sure that our views are expressed you know, in a forthright and clear manner. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to influence policy, and particularly coming out of the bushfires where money, money is being put forward by the federal and state governments to try and ensure and influence effective use of pretty limited funds in the conservation context. Um, I, I remember you telling me about the, the New South Wales partnership and one of the most rewarding moments of your role at you know, the point where we're actually starting to reintroduce animals into those parks. Um, and I've just got an image of um, you late last year, which I'll share. Do you want to talk through this moment and, and what it felt like to get to that point in that project? Yeah, look, I, <laughs> I, I consider myself, yeah, the very stereotypical Australian bloke. I, I grew up in the bush, you know, in a remote area, um, notwithstanding that um, my dad was a National Park stranger for a period of time. But, um, you yeah, know, that National Parks Partnership, we kicked off in 2014 or somewhere somewhere in that area. That was a, it was a big project with a lot of work around understanding the na national park complexities, um, yeah, understanding what it meant as an to be able to influence effective conservation with the, within the public estate, to go through the process of enabling fence building, bringing together a team rather to, to build the fence, to eradicate feral animals, and then to go through that reintroduction process. And then finally to get to that point where you're able to release an animal back into the bush, how, to how you, yeah, you're starting to restore the landscape to what it was like 200 years ago. And it, yeah, well, I'm quite up, honest enough to say it's quite an emotional experience that partly from the culmination of the project that you, you know, and we, we have a, a, an excellent team in the Pilliger and in Mallee Cliffs who have, who have enabled that project, but, um, that broader conservation outcome that we are, we are ensuring the future of a species that shouldn't be lost. There is no excuse in Australia right now for any other species to go extinct. And we're an organisation that's preventing that happening. And to be a part of that is, it's a humbling experience. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to point out for people that aren't familiar with where those projects are, the New South Wales government partnerships are at Mallee Cliffs National Park in the far southwest of the state and in parts of the Pilliga Forest, including the Pilliga State Conservation Area. Um, and that's kind of, sort of in central northern New South Wales, close to Narrabri. Um, and as I said, we'll have a lot more of those projects next week in the webinar. So do join us for that. Um, now, don't forget you can ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom and we'll address some of those. Uh, we actually had a, a few questions that were sent in beforehand. Um, every week we have questions about visiting sanctuaries and at the moment travel restrictions are such that we're unable to host visitors at, at sanctuaries, but that's changing rapidly and we'll keep you posted. So you can always check on our website. Um, and I know people are, are really keen to get out and, and visit some of our sanctuaries on the ground. Tim, there are also lots of questions um, and I might, I'll share the map again, because if you look at it, you know, we've got a fairly good spread across the country, but why don't we have any projects in Victoria or Tasmania? It's a very good question, given I'm, a, I'm <laughs> originally from Victoria, Joey. Um, it's a, it comes back to effective, you know, it's our mission. So our mission is effective conservation of all Australian native wildlife and the habitats in which they live. So it's about where can we deploy effective conservation? So initially when, it, when AWC started, was founded and, and started growing, we're able to deploy effective conservation in all those areas where we are across the north of the country, we're able to secure access to large tracts of land um, very quickly. Um, when you look at somewhere like Tasmania, a lot of Tasmania is reasonably well protected and managed for conservation. So there's not a pressing need for us to be down there. If somebody rang me up tomorrow and said, you know, we've got a, a couple of thousand hectares and would AWC be interested in looking at it? Sure, yeah, I would come down and have a look at it. But securing access to land at a reasonable scale is difficult in Tasmania. And it's very similar to Victoria as well that our model is tends to be about working at the landscape scale. So we're working at scale, we work at 6.5 million hectares. Each of those parcels, you know, apart from a couple of smaller properties at Curramore and Crackmire, um, you know, 65,000 hectares plus. So these are big blocks of land 
securing land like that where we can ensure effective conservation of the landscape scale in Victoria and Tasmania is more difficult. But we are actively looking in Victoria now to uh, undertake projects around species such as the long-footed potteroo, um, koala preservation and conservation uh, and other species. Thanks. Um, so, you know, always prioritising representation of species. As you said, we're trying to have representative populations of every Australian animal species. That's what our, our mission sets out to achieve. And to do that, we need to be working in those areas where we're currently not. But there's a way of prioritising that strategically. Um, another question here about partnerships. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, they've become important in increasing that representation. Um, and you were instrumental in developing the Willigan partnership in the Kimberley. Do you want to just talk to us for a little bit about, um, about that partnership and why it's so important uh, establishing a template for, for this kind of uh, partnership that can be rolled out elsewhere? Yeah, the, the, the Willigan partnership is pretty special for a whole range of reasons. Um, partly from the journey that AWC has been on in the Kimberley where we commenced at Yampi uh, Yampi Sound Training Area, so 570,000 hectares just north of Derby on the northwest Kimberley coastline. And that's Dumba Minyati traditional country. But once defence secured that land, it extinguished, it became freehold, so it extinguished native title access. And so AWC working at Yampi enabled Dumba Minyati to come back out and start working on our biodiversity surveys, fire management, feral animal control, and effectively getting access back to country again. We then formed the partnership with Dumba Minyati about four years ago. Um, and out of that, we sat down and had a, discussed and set up a partnership with the Willigan Aboriginal Corporation um, through that massive area of the Northwest um, Kimberley Coastal Area. Uh, it's, it's really important. It's, it's country that is culturally important. It's country that the traditional owners have been looking after and been custodians and managing for not just recent times, but for tens of thousands of years. And we know that it's the home to some pretty special creatures that are on the top of the list of species most likely to go extinct. And so for our science team to be able to go out there and work with the traditional owners and custodians to learn from, the, from them what's special about it and from the traditional owners to learn from our scientists on you know, how, to, how to collect imagery, how to collect data and how to understand and inventorize what's out there is, is pretty important to make sure that that area is protected for decades and centuries to come. Um, another really important partnership, which you touched on before, was the Bullo River Station partnership. And, you know, that, that point you made that uh, more than half the Australian mainland is currently under some, sort of, some form of pastoral management. Um, do you want to talk about the opportunity at Bullo River to develop a new model, uh, which is allowing conservation and pastoralism to work hand in hand? Yeah, it, it is, and it's, it's one that I'm particularly interested in for both the what it means for Bullo River, and there's a great photo of Bullo River. It's a spectacular part of the world, and I'll just give a shout out to Bullo River themselves that they they run a, a an excellent um, tourism eco tourism venture there where you can go and stay and and spend time there, and I highly encourage people to do it. It's very well managed and very well run. Yeah, it's but... great for what it. Sorry. No, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so it's, it's great for what it means that Bullo River, you know, if you take it back to a philosophical point of view, um, we all like to eat meat, or not all of us, but people like to eat their meat. I'm, I'm a person, I like my rump steak. So we still need to grow cows. So Bullo River is a demonstration that you can have great conservation outcomes whilst also running a commercial operation, such as a cattle growing oper operation. The owners of Bullo River, understand the conservation values and through some of that early work that our science team have done there and Eri Mulder who you spoke to the other week you know, detected the scaly tailed possum the Wailda and that's a, a great example of understanding the conservation values that it's the first time it's been recorded in the Northern Territory and it's an extension of their range um, we can now manage that land to ensure the future of that species it means that we can then pick up that model and go and talk to other pastoralists where there's much more conservation land, uh, conservation opportunities within that pastoral estate. As you said, 51% of the Australian land mass is under some form of pastoralism. It's self-evident that many conservation opportunities are going to be present in that land. Yeah, it's um, it sure is a stunning part of the world. And 
you know, we're still uncovering new species. I know Eri's been on the ground there just in the last week setting camera traps. Um, the discovery of that scaly-tailed possum was a really significant find well outside its known distribution. So who knows what else we'll, we'll uncover there. Um, Tim, I'm interested in what you see as, uh, you know, the vision for AWC going forward. Uh, what do you think our priorities should be over the next decade, say, what's the role of government and, and, and what's the role of private conservation and how does AWC fit into that picture? <laughs> you, you, you've asked a question that's going to get me on my soapbox, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I keep bringing it back. We're guided ultimately by our mission. Our mission is the effective conservation of all Australian native wildlife and the habitats in which they live. That's what we do. We have a vision, which is about an engaged population helping to deliver effective conservation. So, yeah, you know, when we talk about private land conservation, the conservation status in Australia is not going to improve until there's better investment in private land conservation. So there's a lot of work happening right now in influencing and lobbying government to invest in private land conservation. And this is a must. You, know, you only have to look at the Kangaroo Island example of yeah, there we were at the at the height of the bushfire crisis when we know species were at threat. AWC's turned up, our team of, you know, Eri Mulder, Joe Schofield, Murray Schofield have turned up and within a matter of weeks, we've got fences being built before a bloody camera trap had even turned up or been deployed by the government. There's got to be a, a conscious decision by government to invest in private land conservation organisations like AWC who are nimble and can react to a situation and solve the problem and, in, and you know, generate great outcomes. And the Kangaroo Island project, I think, is, is just a classic example of what government should be looking to invest in and support in, that conservation of the future is not just about national park estate. In fact, I'd argue much national park estate is poor conservation. Government should be looking to private land conservation as a way of the future. It's about how we're going to get more um, tangible and better conservation outcomes over the next decade or so. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the best endorsements of our work is that investment, you know, the example of the New South Wales government partnering with us right. to, to help manage Mallee Cliffs National Park and the work in the Pilliga. Um, I think by demonstrating our effective model for conservation, that's now slowly being adopted by other agencies. Um, and I think that's an area where AWC can have a, a really major influence over what conservation looks like and how it's, how it's delivered. Yeah, so when you, you know, the future would look like, you know, there's certainly going to be more partnerships that we will do. And that'll be, you know, we'll, we're always um, uh, happy to talk to Indigenous communities and Indigenous groups, pastoral companies and operations, um, and through to the public estate. Um, so partnerships will play a part of the future, a significant part of the future but not the only part. We'll always be looking for those acquisition opportunities and we're always reviewing opportunities, both partnership and acquisition, almost weekly. Um, various projects come across our desk to be considered. Um, so we're always, always looking for those opportunities. It's an exciting time because I think there is a lot of potential for, for the adoption of this model um, across all sorts of different estates. Um, now, we, we were talking about bushfire recovery projects there and... Again, lots of questions about whether or not we'll be working in Victoria or, you know, that southeast corner of the country anytime soon. Um, and we've, we've actually, well, we're developing some interest in work in, in a project down there. Do you want to talk about that work and, and what we're trying to achieve in that part of the country? So you're talking about the Potter in particular? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well... <laughs> Um, I have a particular interest in this part of the world, obviously for originating there, and my mum and dad both still live in that part of the world. Um, but the long-footed potteroo is one of the species that were heavily impacted by the bushfires through East Gippsland in particular and, and you know, through more central Victoria. Um, so if you... The AWC's model is about understanding the priorities. What are the conservation priorities about the work that we're going to do? So we use that to inform our decision making. And we understand that the long-footed pottery was heavily impacted. In fact, it wasn't far behind the Kangaroo Island Dunnart in terms of how much, how, how much, what percentage of its habitat had been destroyed by those bushfires. So it's self-evident, again, that we need to step in and do an effective conservation project for those 
for that species and I, any other species that might exist, including flora. Um, and we know a number of plants have been heavily impacted and some particular species of plants, there's only very small numbers of them. So if we can do projects that protect a number of species, flora and fauna, then, uh, then that's what we should be doing. Ultimately, it's about securing access to land. So we're actively looking for land in that area. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting. And we might have more to say about that in the next couple of weeks, um, but can't say too much more at the moment. Um, <laughs> now, just to remind everyone, I, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today, but you can still ask questions by using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your question today, because there are a lot coming in, we've got about 300 people online at the moment, um, I apologise, but we will try and get back to you with an answer and provide you with some information about uh, the area that you're interested in. And don't forget, you can always get in touch with any of us at AWC. Give us a call or send an email. Um, we're always happy to have a chat, especially for those of you that are still stuck at home uh, due to the COVID <laughs> lockdown. Um, all right, we've got a, a question here that's come in. Um, Tim, do you think that the challenges in conservation have changed uh, in the time that you've been working in the field? Are there new challenges that, that weren't part of the picture when you started? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, because it, you know, the question goes to both the challenges as AWC is growing, so we need more people. So we're looking for those skilled people to come to AWC and help deliver the, the mission and the programs of AWC. There's obviously the support and we need the financial support to enable doing what we do. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a requirement to start bringing in new skills into conservation. And I think conservation has probably tended to be a bit inward looking. Um, we've tended to preach to the converted. So I think, you know, one of the things I like about AWC is, you know, I'm an example of that. I, I was at one, an oil and gas project before I came to AWC. We've got a number of people starting to join who don't come from a traditional conservation background to help deliver and work in that more complex environment of partnerships, particularly in the public estate where it can be quite complex working within a bureaucracy. From a conservation point of view more generally, it's certainly, I think there's a trans, we're going through a transition in conservation in Australia that partly whilst the bushfires were as traumatic as they were, it has created a bit of an awakening and a sense of the loss and the impact and the potential of the loss that bushfires can create. And then there's, a, yeah, there's an awakening within the conservation sector, I think, to, to understand that we've got to be more outward looking and how do we bring along the community for that, for that journey and not just think about it as an inward looking conservation sector trying to deliver something. We need to bring the whole community along for the ride. I think that's that's very important, and you know the bushfires really galvanised the focus on conservation. That's I think right. because it was such a lot of pressure on wildlife, um, and I, I guess the challenge now is to convert that into uh, a focus that's maintained and translates into real conservation on the ground um, that actually makes a difference. Um, a couple of questions now about the business model. So just very simply, what's AWC's budget and how is that generated? Is it all through donations? What's the mix? Um, so the, yeah, the, if, I, if I talk about the business model and the structure of AWC, you know, really it's about science and operations working together. So we have about 40% about of our team uh, within the science team. Um, then the next uh, a significantly large chunk is, I'm gonna get my maths all around the wrong way, but you know, maybe about 50% is land management. And then the balance is made up of um, those supporting services of HR and finance. Um, of our income, um, it varies year to year, but it's anywhere between 60 and 70% of our income is reliant upon donations. So that's individuals choosing to support AWC. Um, and that's you know, a part of our message today is that, um, you know, we hope that people listen to this and understand AWC is a, a great organisation to support the mission and the people and the outcomes that we, we're generating. Um, our annual operating budget, again, varies year to year, depending on what projects we're, we're trying to deliver. But if you, you use about that $30 million is our general annual operating budget, but it can vary up a couple of million to 30 to 33 to 34 million if we're trying to deliver some large projects. That's a, that's a big effort for the fundraising team. So for everyone who's tuned in, Thank you for your support. And if you're inspired to make a further donation, 
uh, you can go to our website, australianwildlife.org. Uh, we've got a great campaign at the moment where you can choose any of the projects that you're especially passionate about and make a donation, or you can make a, um, an untethered gift to general operations. We appreciate every dollar. Um, so thank you for the support you've given us so far. Um, and I encourage anyone who hasn't to, to make a donation if you're interested. Um, all right, we've got another question here. It's a bit of an interesting one about our relationship with zoos and how zoos are assisting with conservation projects. So uh, I know that we recently talked about the rescue of a population of koalas from the Blue Mountains during the bushfires. Uh, and AWC played a small part in that, in the release of koalas afterwards with one of our ecologists uh, on site for that, a specialist tree climber ecologist. Um, and you can catch up on that webinar with Andy Howe if you'd like to on the website. Um, but Tim, more broadly, what role do zoos play and, and do we have a specific relationship with zoos or is it based on particular projects? Um, I look, it's, it's probably more project based, but we have a quite a strong relationship with the major zoos in Australia and particularly, I think Perth Zoo is a classic example. So they've been supporters of AWC for many, many years um, through their um, chief executive in particular. Um, they contributed towards the Mount Gibson fenced area project, but then they've also undertaken breeding programs, uh, particularly around the numbats uh, and other species that then have been translocated to, to Mount Gibson. The same applies to um, Adelaide Zoo um, with red-tailed fascigales, um, where we've, um, we've been aiming to breed them up before they get released into fenced areas through to Taronga Zoo or New South Wales Zoo, Sydney Zoo, whatever its latest name is, um, in some of the work they're doing through Bilby um, breeding programs as well. So there's a strong, there's a strong relationship there. And I think it's an important relationship that we can't do everything that's needed from a conservation point of view. Our model, getting back to that business model question, is people in the field, it's boots on the ground, doing the work that's needed. It's that science and land management programs. That's what we do. So we're not gonna have all the capacity and capability um, to run those breeding programs, to set up all of those facilities. And so working in partnership with people, organizations such as zoos will be a part of that future. Thanks. Um, another interesting question here about balancing um, the need to, to do land management activities like destocking. Uh, this person's visited Mornington and remembers that destocking was an important part of that program there. Uh, and yet we're partnering with uh, cattle producers in some cases, like at Bullo River uh, and other places in the Kimberley. Um, how do we balance those competing priorities? Sorry, just re say that again, Joey. Sure. So, you know, we, we know that uh, feral herbivores like cattle pose a threat, and so we're destocking them at places sure. like Mornington. Uh, and on the other hand, we're entering partnerships with cattle producers where parts of the property are run for cattle. Sure. Um, how do we navigate, you know, what's appropriate and what the balance needs to be between those different priorities? Sure. Well, I think that's part of the pragmatic approach of AWC, that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, Australia is a big place. Um, there's a lot of, you know, if we go back to that discussion we had earlier about land access, <coughs> excuse me, about how we secure access to land, um, we need to be pragmatic about how we're going to solve some of those conservation issues. So where we've been fortunate, where we can buy land and destock cattle, either from the entirety of the property or from areas that are environmentally sensitive, that's great. But then somewhere like Bullo River is a realisation and an understanding that Australia still needs a trade in cattle. We, to, to take the view that we should just destock Australia is not sensible and it's not, it, it, you know, that's not going to be the outcome. So it's about working in partnership to protect those areas of high conservation value um, and allow a commercial operation to continue. To me, that sits well. Um, it's, it's taking a very pragmatic approach on conservation outcomes. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's um, a very practical approach and it's, it's obviously mm -hmm. delivering the results. And we've seen that, you know, at Mornington, we've seen the small mammal numbers more than double over the long term. Uh, we've seen through our fire management projects, the incident right. with those destructive late season fires more than half across areas that we manage in Northern Australia. So they're the outcomes that drive our approach. Um, we might, might go to one final question. So get your questions in now if you're keen, but uh, we're pretty close to time. So, um, so thanks for your time so far, Tim. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it actually. We're, 
we're done for questions. So thank you everyone. If we didn't get to address your question today, uh, we'll try and get back to you with some information. Uh, if you're interested in making a donation before the end of financial year, please do so at our website, australianwildlife.org. And remember that 86 cents of every dollar goes to our people on the ground, our staff working at the front line of conservation, doing the fire management, dealing with the feral animals, dealing with the weeds, um, and delivering those great outcomes for Australian wildlife. Um, thank you for everyone who tuned in for all of your support, because we couldn't do this work without your help. Um, and so I, I hope you continue to support AWC. I hope you'll join me next week to hear more about our projects in New South Wales. Uh, Tim, anything else you'd like to add? Look, Joey, you actually touched on some of the key points that where AWC is an organisation about delivering effective conservation. We use, we invest the money that's donated to AWC wisely. And as you said, you know, around 86 cents of every dollar is invested in the field. And that's a critically important point, you know, going back to that government investment in private land conservation. But I think more broadly, you know, we, we talk about AWC as being a family, and it doesn't matter whether you're an ecologist, whether you're one of those land managers that I talked about earlier, whether you're a member of our board and how committed our board are in supporting the activities of AWC, or you're a supporter who's donating or is thinking about donating money you're a part of the team. You're a part of what makes this happen. You know, sure, we're the people out there, not me personally, but there's teams of people out there doing this work and delivering these programs in the field. But when you make a donation to AWC, you're ensuring, you are tangibly ensuring the effective survival of species into the future. The bilbies at Mallet Cliffs last week, through to the Purple Crown Fairy Rents at Mornington, to the Marla at New Haven in Central Australia, your support makes that happen. Without your support, we can't do that work. So please give. If you're thinking about giving, please give. And if you have given, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Tim, very much for your time. Uh, I know you're very busy, so it was great to be able to have this chat with you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And I hope you'll join me next week to hear more about the bilbies in New South Wales.